Hello everyone. On this trip I was attempting, where possible, to try and review as many American or certainly domestic market cars as I could. Stuff like that Camaro that's just whipped past. And today I'm afraid I have failed you. But I'm not going to apologise because what I've brought to you is absolutely stunning. Spoiler alert, I love this car. What are we talking about? It's the Lexus LC500. Lexus are a strange old company. In fact, the vast majority of their product lineup I would never be interested in simply because, well, the choice of drivetrain is just unexciting. The cars themselves are actually quite nice, they're certainly very well finished on the inside. I've raved in the past as well about how I love the Lexus customer service, or at least the limited exposure that I've had to it, and so if ever I had the money to buy a nice, expensive, luxury car as a daily, well, a Lexus would certainly be high on that list. Sadly, most of the range is uh, stuck with, well, hybrids with auto boxes, or even worse, CVTs, and well, as a petrol head, there's only so much I'm willing to compromise on, and I draw the line there. And then they go and drop a bombshell like this. Now, we all remember the LFA very fondly, of course, but that was a 300 plus thousand pound near hypercar, really. And even nowadays, they are serious money because, well, they're pretty epic and, of course, well, very unattainable. This thing to look at, you would think, is maybe a more affordable version of the LFA. In truth, it's nothing of the sort. What this is, is a Japanese Aston Martin. This is Grand Tourer, pure and simple. And honestly, when the Japanese put their minds to it, they can produce some absolutely extraordinary things. Let's start with the looks of this car. I'm not even sure I actually like the way that it looks, but I just can't help staring at it. It's so strikingly different and so very typically Japanese. There's absolutely no way that this car could have come from a European or American manufacturer. Just couldn't. I love them for that. And the interior. Oh my word. I drive a lot of very nice cars on a very regular basis. My perception of everything, I will freely admit, is probably a bit skewed. However, this car is a very, very special thing to be in. This is absolutely stunning in here. From things like the steering wheel, which is just the right size and lovely to hold, the nice metal paddles, okay, they've not got the best response when you hit them, but they are nice to touch. The little display here with the physical section that moves across just like it did in the LFA. And the whole old school supercar jutting out here of the dash and the big display up here, it all feels, well, nice. This is the sort of car that if you told me cost a hundred grand, I would go, yep, yep, totally see that. Doesn't. Now, unlike the LFA, which you'd guess maybe was a 200 grand car and actually was closer to 400, this goes the other way. These are available from just over 70. Now, granted, you can spec one up to just over 90, but it is, as far as I know, impossible to spend a hundred thousand pounds on one of these. And if you're looking at the sort of cool GT car market, the benchmark really is going to be an Aston Martin. And the cheapest Aston Martin that you can buy starts, list, at 122 grand. In other words, 50,000 pounds more than this. Now, for sure, I'm sure that the uh, Vantage is a faster car all round. It's got more power, more torque, and somehow it's actually lighter than this. And we'll get onto that in a bit. But you know what? I really don't care. I've got a personal philosophy that whenever you're spending more than, let's just say, about £20,000 on a car, it's got to be a case of want more than need. I can really almost never justify anyone spending more than about twenty grand on a car. So when you're looking at these £50,000, £500,000 cars, you've got to just lust for it. 
and this I lust for in a way that I simply don't with the new Aston. Just FYI, I haven't actually driven the new Aston yet, so just ignore that. Let's keep talking about this car in isolation. I'm also on the wrong side of the car to what I'm used to, but with an auto box, that doesn't really matter. And the gearbox in this car is something that a lot of people do talk about, and I personally think they generally get it wrong. This has a 10-speed traditional torque converter automatic in it. Now, some people, for whatever reason, assume that it would be kind of your normal ratios, but spread out over 10 gears, so that, you know, 10th would be the same as, like, 6th or 7th in a normal car, and that would be a great way of keeping the slightly peaky and rev-happy engine in its happy place. Instead, the gearbox is set up so that the first six gears are what you'd expect them to be, and the others are, well, just for cruising, really. And I'm fine with that. I think that's the way to do it. That means that when you're driving in manual mode like I am now, the gears all sort of do roughly what you expect them to. And then when you set the car into drive, it can drop the revs right down to almost tick over on the motorway and it'll try and eke out some sort of half decent fuel economy. Now there is a hybrid version of this car available with a three and a half litre V6 petrol engine combined with a hybrid power plant. Personally, I don't see the point. It's better on fuel than this to the tune of about 10 miles per gallon, but it's still not great. And if you're gonna go for a car like this, just bugger it, buy this. And that V8 is one of the sweetest sounding engines you will ever come across. It's a joy. And you know what? I don't really care if it's artificial or not. It sounds glorious. Here, let me show you. Wonderful. Now the car doesn't really produce explosive performance for one very simple reason. That 480 horsepower and 390 pound-foot of torque is charged with moving almost two tons of car. This thing weighs around about 1,900 kilos. For my friends on this side of the pond, that's over 4,000 pounds. It's a lot. Why does it weigh so much? And it's a conversation I've had with a lot of people like, how is it so heavy? Why is it so heavy? What's the point? Well, basically, the point is that this is not a sports car. This is a luxurious Grand Tourer. Now, the people at Lotus, the chassis engineers at Lotus, and let's agree here, I think they know what they're talking about when it comes to chassis tech. They told me that making a car's chassis stiffer isn't always for the benefit of handling, but it definitely benefits ride quality, noise, vibration, and harshness, all of those markers that make a car feel more expensive. You may have seen quoted very often the fact that the new Bugatti Chiron is an extremely stiff car, and that helps it basically feel better made, more luxurious. It's the same with this. This is a stiffer car than the LFA, which had a carbon fiber structure. This doesn't have anything as fancy in it. Now, I'm not entirely sure which version of the car this one is. In the UK, they're available in three trim levels, potentially four. You've got the base LC500, you've got the LC500 Sport, then there's a Sport Plus, and then there are some limited editions, which are essentially a Sport Plus, but with fancy colors or whatever. They did a nice one called Structural Blue, which is the bluest blue anyone's ever painted a car. What a very Japanese thing to do. Now, in the UK, the easiest way to tell the base car apart is the fact that it's got 20-inch rims on, unlike the 21s, which the others have, and which this car has on it. 21s, to me, seems a little bit extreme, but the car still rides actually pretty well. Now, I've got it in Sport Plus mode as well, and this road is not too bad. It's a parkway road, um, but it's not the smoothest in the world either. It's certainly no racetrack. The other things you get in the higher end car, the Sport Plus, include that carbon roof and a mechanical limited slip diff at the back and rear wheel steering. And this car doesn't have any of those. So I think it is the Sport one, or maybe it's a trim level that they only do in the USA because sometimes these things do not translate. So if somebody knows what it is and I've got it wrong, please do tell me. The color I believe is called infrared and it is spectacular. I doubt my camera's done it any justice, but this thing looks utterly awesome. Ooh, tunnel time.
Uh, the steering, although it's not got heaps of feedback, is actually very nicely weighted and the car responds brilliantly. It hides its two tons phenomenally well. And I know there's a few people out there that are gonna be um, a little bit upset about what I have to say next, but honestly, it is true. This car, for let's say for argument's sake, for 85,000 pounds is an utter bargain. And if you don't wanna take my word for it, go and watch the Motor Trend review which compared the LC500 with the Aston Martin DB11. Not even the V8 version, they compared it with the V12. And that review, the DB11 won. But if you listen to it, listen to what they say, in every single meaningful way, the LC500 is the better car. The fact that it's half the price doesn't even really enter into it. And even if they were the same price, it sounds to me like the Lexus is the better car. This thing is so solid, so nice to look at, so well put together, and a special place to be. And that is a rare thing in the motoring world today. It's very hard for me to talk about a car that is without fault. So I'm not gonna do that. There is a fault in this car. There is a fault in this car that is so major, it's put off at least one person that I know from buying one of them, and that's the infotainment system here. This car is specced with the Mark Levinson Hi-Fi, which works very, very well indeed. And um, rather than having the usual rotary style controller that basically every other manufacturer has now adopted, or, or a touch screen, you have a little pad down here with which you control everything. And, I suppose you could say that it's a kind of clever, cool idea or whatever, or it's a little bit funky or a little bit different, but the car's owner basically describes it as a hazard. And I can see where he's coming from. When you're concentrating and you know what you're doing, you can kind of get stuff done. But if you're just trying to intuitively move through things or, you know, I'm in this car for the first time and I want to change the radio station, it's a faff and you get distracted and that is poor design and that's just the sole element of this car that I can find where they went a little bit too Japanese and a little bit too far. Otherwise, this is an epic machine. Thank you all for watching. Hope you've enjoyed today's review. I think the next one might be a bit more Japanese stuff as well. Sorry about that, but I hope you'll agree that it's worth my time and yours. We'll see you for the next one. Please comment below, hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.